Uh, kia ora tato. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the rocky reef component of the Tipping Points project. Um, so this is a, I don't know, I guess it's a bit of a smaller component of the overall Tipping Points project and it's a collaboration between um, researchers at University of Auckland and Canterbury, um, oh, and Niwa. So myself and two of my PhD students, Caitlin Blaine and Christine Hansen, have been working sort of in the north. Um, down around Canterbury we have um, Dave Shiel and Lee Tate and their PhD student, uh, Marika. So I think, I assume everybody you know, would agree with me when I say that these are sort of iconic, important um, ecosystems in our coast, these rocky reefs. So I'm talking about subtidal um, rocky reefs that when they're healthy they look something like this. They, lots of kelps and seaweeds, there's lots of values associated with these reefs, whether it's commercial, recreational, customary um, or ecological. There's a wide range of ecosystem services, um, they're important sources of primary production, um, lots of species that we treasure um, live on these reefs. So as we've heard with um, through ecosystem based management, the idea is we're recognising that healthy ecosystem or the ecosystem services are reliant on these ecosystems being healthy. However, there are um, obviously a lot of stresses on these systems and we've seen from Candida's talk that um, with continued pressures there can be small increases in, sorry I forgot to mention the posters, so um, Dave and Lee and Marika all have posters on their components, some of their work, so go and, go and look at those. Um, but um, there's, there's these non-linear changes in, in these systems. So the system's pushed to a point where it, it crashes or there's large ecosystem changes um, which, have, which can be hard to reverse. So on rocky reefs, the most well understood and well studied example is the shift from a kelp forest to an urchin barren. Um, so what happens is you have a healthy kelp forest here um, and you've, that can have sea urchins living in it but once they, the urchins increase above a critical level, you get a shift to an urchin barren, basically where they've eaten all of the kelp. So this results in reduced productivity, it functions very differently, low species, the, the species diversity. Basically the modi of this reef has been lost. These kinna, which um, people like to eat, they're not even worth eating from these kinna barrens. So how do we, how do we get them back? Basically we have to re reduce the urchin numbers to a much lower level um, because low numbers of urchins can actually maintain these habitats, so it's much harder to shift them back. Um, you've got to go back to lower levels and then you get this reversal. So these non-linear dynamics are what make one of the challenges with ecosystem-based management. Now on rocky reefs um, there's a number of um, important stresses around our coast and the Hauraki Gulf here is an exemplar of the sort of different type of stresses we have. Um, Fishing is one of the big ones, and if we zoom in on the Noises Islands here, I found this aerial image when I was doing some work out here. Middle of winter, a nice Saturday morning, there's about 90 boats out there. Um, it's intense, and they're all doing one thing, they're, they're fishing for, for snapper and a few other select species. So fishing's a big one on our reefs. Um, sedimentation, obviously, you can see in the Firth of Thames here, and the, the large spatial gradients in sediment. Um, and then overlaying all of this we have um, climate change. So there's a range of impacts. I'm going to talk to you briefly today about sort of tipping points that stem from fishing and then the work which we've been focusing on as part of the tipping points program around sedimentation. Okay, so I've kind of already shown you the tipping point that results from um, overfishing on our shallow reefs and we know this through um, well, globally. This pattern's been shown to occur as a result of overfishing of predators and we've seen that in our marine reserves in northern New Zealand. When you, recover, when you protect these reserves, um, snapper and crayfish are able to recover. Over time they reduce the urchin densities down to below that critical level and the kelp forests come back. That can take up to 25 years, um, at least from our experience in northern New Zealand. And just as an example of this, this is one of the reserves where it's been demonstrated in northern New Zealand, the Tafranui Reserve. Um, if you look inside the reserve, it's about four kilometres long. Inside the reserve here you've got nice dark reefs which are covered in kelp and seaweeds. But as you move towards the edges you'll see there's a margin of light coloured reef all the way around the surrounding coasts. And that's your urchin barrens. 
So that's been clearly demonstrated in northern New Zealand, um, but what about um, other places? Um, this is some data from surveys I did quite some time ago now um, around, around New Zealand. It's actually part of a DOC funded project which showed that yeah, in northern New Zealand there's a lot of urchin barrens on these shallow reefs, but there's also other locations which quite surprising where you get extensive barrens like offshore islands on the west coast, the top of the North Island there's extensive barrens on the shallow reefs and also parts of the you know, in inlets down around um, Stewart Island and Fiordland. So it's not just a northern New Zealand thing, um, there are large areas of coast where these barrens don't occur, like south, mostly down this whole southeastern coast, um, where other stresses potentially limit the urchin um, numbers. Um, so I guess from an ecosystem based management point of view, these urchin barrens do provide a good um, indicator of overfishing and also for monitoring recovery. Um, and we do know that recovery is possible through what we've seen in marine reserves in northern New Zealand, so through spatial management. Um, but it does take time and there may be other um, stresses on these systems that actually slow down or even prevent the recovery back to a, um, a kelp forest. So that's kind of where we're at with, with fishing, that's kind of all been well documented previously. And as, as I've sort of mentioned, our focus for this project is more on um, the impacts of sedimentation on these reefs around the coast. Um, obviously we have highly erosive soils, coupled, sorry, coupled with um, poor, historically poor, but I guess improving in a lot of places, um, land management, which results in high sediment loads into the surrounding coast. And when we think about the reefs and the seaweeds, the, the modi of those reefs is really dependent on light, the availability of light for kelp to grow and fuel the system, and that's severely compromised by sediments in our surrounding coast. And you can see from this you know, satellite image the spatial variability in sediment around the coast. It's a big issue in lots of places. Um, and so that's what we've been doing with this project is focusing on turbidity gradients in different locations around, around New Zealand, um, particularly up in the Hauraki Gulf and Banks Peninsula and on Wednesday we head down to Picton and we're going to be heading out into the Marlborough Sounds and doing some of this work in the Marlborough Sounds. Um, we're doing a range of things such as measuring light levels, um, in situ measuring species distributions with depth and across these gradients. We're looking at the photosynthetic performance of seaweeds, how they, are they able to adapt to low light, um, how does it compare among different species. We can use this information to then estimate productivity on the reefs, um, as well as do various sorts of experiments where we can manipulate light levels to better understand the patterns that, or behind, understand the mechanisms that are driving the patterns we see in the field. Uh, we've also in the Haraki Gulf done a big experiment looking at the resilience of kelp forests to disturbance across the gradient. Okay, so. Um, as far as sort of light gradients go and turbidity gradients, this is just showing from the inner to the outer Hauraki Gulf, just as something you can kind of relate to. In the inner gulf here, visibility is about 3 metres versus about 20 metres in the outer gulf. So that equates to only about 25% of the, of the amount of light getting down to um, 10 metres compared to what gets down out of the outer gulf. And what we see is there's a big shift in the algal communities um, across this gradient. So in the inner gulf, where it's more turbid, we get carpophyllum flexuosum, which um, someone referred to last night, it sounds like the gorse of the sea. Nothing likes to eat it, it's poor, really low productivity, um, whereas you move out into clearer water, you get a shift to a colonia forest. Now on the surface, these two habitats might not look very different. They're both seaweed dominated habitats, but functionally they're really different. They have much higher productivity in the kelp forest, supports more species. Um, so we see a real shift on these reefs. And those sort of patterns are evident in other parts of the country with carpophyllum flexuosum being a highly light tolerant, low light tolerant species and dominating in turbid areas like Gisborne and Banks Peninsula. Now one thing we also did was the uh, experimental removal of kelp across these sites where kelp occurred and we found that as you move into the gulf, as you increase the turbidity, the risk of changing to that flexuosum dominated um, state um, changes. So we looked at the recovery of kelp over two years. Um, this was actually part of 
work leading into the um, Tipping Points project. After two years you can see you've got a full recovery in the outer gulf, whereas that inner gulf site you've actually had a shift from what was a colonia before we cleared it to um, Carpophyllum flexuosum forest. So these sites, are, um, turbid sites, are likely to flip, uh, sort of uh, at risk of flipping to the um, different state. Okay, so um, work that marika has been doing down in Canterbury has shown that the seaweeds can adapt and they have higher photosynthetic efficiency um, at turbid sites compared to clear sites. Notice she works on a different scale to which we work on in the Haraki Gulf um, with much higher turbidity. Um, but the plants generally at turbid sites are more efficient and we see whoops, similar sorts of things in kelp across that um, gradient. So the kelp in the macroalgae can adapt to low light levels um, but it doesn't really offset the overwhelming kind of effect of turbidity on productivity. So this is showing um, turbidity that we've estimated across the Hauraki Gulf, um, which is about, sorry, with productivity, which is about four times higher in the outer Hauraki Gulf um, than on the reefs in the inner Gulf. So that's looking at productivity across a constant depth. But one of, you know, most people will probably realise that as you increase turbidity, the depth of the macroalgae gets um, shallower and shallower. And we see this um, across the, the Hauraki Gulf. This is just showing the, sort of how the light varies. So in the outer Hauraki Gulf, kelp extends down beyond 30 metres, or beyond 20 to 30 metres, whereas in the inner Gulf it's restricted to less than 10 metres. Now if we put Banks light data from Banks Peninsula on here, 95% of the light is cut out by the time you get down to 5 metres depth. Right? So, and what corresponds to that is the, cup of the seaweeds are all up in about five metres or shallower. So you've got this really pronounced shallowing of the algae, algal forest and you've also got a shift to predominantly carpophyllum flexuosum which we know is, is very tolerant um, to low light. So, um, getting through it. Um, so Sedimentation obviously is a major impact. It's highly variable um, around the coast and we've seen through this work it does drive these shifts in the algal assemblages um, to more tolerant or light tolerant species that have lower productivity, um, lower species diversity. But importantly we also see a, a severe shallowing of those, um, of the depth and extent of those algal forests. Um, this has consequences for the um, Obviously the function, the values, the modi of these reefs is severely compromised by um, the sedimentation. Um, but we also, oops, we've found through this work that there are some very basic indicators of, that we can use to sort of look at how reefs, either how they're degraded or how they are recovering, such as looking at um, the prevalence of these low light tolerant species and those depth distributions of the macroalgal habitats. Um, is recovery possible? We haven't really got there yet. Um, there's likely to be feedbacks that, are maintain, that maintain the sort of the current states and that's been seen through um, Dave's work and with the earthquake, um, following with the large sediment loads that have gone in there, there's a huge amount of feedbacks that prevent recovery. Um, and obviously for recovery to occur we need long-term sort of improvements in our land management practices. So this is really the long-term game in terms of improving, reducing the sediment loads in the surrounding coast and whether that's possible um, or where that's possible. Um, so where we're going next is sort of trying to now understand, piece together how these different stresses um, interact. Um, so sediment and fishing as well as other stresses. So climate change, obviously a big one, which is actually going to be a double whammy in terms of sedimentation. So with more extreme events, sea level rise, um, accelerated coastal erosion, it's actually going to increase the amount of sediment in the surrounding coast, coupled with sort of variation in ocean warming around the coast, and also um, increases, sorry, in air temperature. So the heat wave events that have been happening and the large scale sort of changes that have been seen in some of the systems, such as around Banks Peninsula where um, Dave survived but um, the, the kelp hasn't. So next steps, we're heading off into the Marlborough Sounds um, for the next week and a half. Um, we're going to be working 
and around Queen Charlotte Sound, looking at the gradients across um, in turbidity and also fishing pressure. So the Long Island Marine Reserve here provides a control against the effects of fishing. Um, 20, almost 20 years ago when I surveyed the Long Island Marine Reserve, it was predominantly urchin barrens, so it provides a chance to sort of go back and see, have some of those barrens recovered? Are there other stresses acting in that system that are preventing the recovery of kelp on those um, rocky reefs? So thanks to um, Sustainable Seas and I'll hand it over to the next speaker.